Is a phone that's off really off? Can a phone communicate while you have it turned off? This is a very interesting question, actually, and something that Edward Snowden explored. In fact, Snowden worked with another party to develop a case for the phone to detect RF signals while the phone was off. So this was a threat that he was definitely concerned about. It's safe to say that Snowden did not trust that a phone would be off if the power was off. And of course, being exposed to the activities of three-letter agencies, he may know something I don't. While this has not been a threat I've ever discussed or focused much on in the past, maybe it's time to explore if this is really possible and what technology could be used. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that this is more of a hypothetical. It is unfortunately quite difficult for me to set up a laboratory that is free of RF so we can detect emissions, especially since I have lots of phones near me at all times. Still, this would be interesting to theorize because you will actually understand a bit of the technologies involved and how they can be used. It will be educational at the very least, so stay right there. I'm on the platform odyssey.com. I'm now one of the top creators on there. Just for insurance, in case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. My company offers a VPN service, Bytes VPN, the Google phones, VPN routers. Now we offer a Braxmail email service. These products are made to protect you from big tech and their tricks to profile us. If you're interested in them, they are on my app, Braxme. The link is in the description. Let me restate the first question we want to answer today. Could your phone be communicating in some way while the power is off? This topic was discussed in the comments of my last video and it is definitely interesting to explore. Frankly, when Edward Snowden discussed this around 2015 or so, I thought this wasn't a privacy threat to the average person. Let's say your phone was given to you by your three-letter agency employer. Well, since it is not your phone, it is quite possible that some espionage-related hardware could have been installed on it. That is definitely possible. But I didn't think the threat spread to the common consumer devices that people have today, and that's the Apple iPhones and the Androids. But new technology has become available recently. And now the ability for a phone to communicate at low power is now not only possible, but is being used in many tech products. This threat, by the way, is not entirely imagined. If you have an Intel processor, there is a high likelihood that your processor will have the feature called Intel Management Engine, IME, which is part of the vPro feature set. On most Intel machines, mostly since 2011 or so, Intel placed two CPUs on the motherboard. You're mostly aware of the main CPU, which is what your computer uses when it is running Windows or Mac OS. What you did realize is that the second CPU chip embedded in the Intel processor can be remotely controlled. Corporate clients are provided with software so computers can be remotely controlled by the IT department. Whether this IME can be controlled by three-letter agencies is unknown, so I'll talk about what is known and what the IT department can do. They can turn on the computer from an off state. They can replace the OS and reinstall everything completely. They can examine the hard drive. The intent of this is supposedly benign since it is made to allow remote tech support by giving IT complete control of the computer. It can talk over a network interface even when there is no power to the main CPU. Now keep this image in your mind. In other words, the second CPU has a separate power source and bypasses the manual switch of the computer. So the Intel processor has two power sources available to it, switched and unswitched, and this is regardless of the operating system you are using, meaning Windows or Mac OS. This is actually quite a scary issue since people fear that someone external could take over their computer and download its contents. An IME client accesses the IME chip on the Intel processor via a network interface. Again, consider this little detail. Not only does the IME chip get power separately from the rest of the computer, the IME chip apparently also powers a network interface since you are able to wake up the chip from a network traffic received in a particular port. In simple terms, not only can the IME chip can be separately powered, bypassing the main switch, 
but it can also communicate through its own network connections. Now, don't be overly worried about this on your Intel computer because the IME feature only works inside a local area network or LAN. This was designed to operate in a corporate network where the IT department has LAN access to every device. Your home network is not reachable from the internet because of something in your router called NAT or Network Address Translation, which acts as an automatic kind of firewall. So by default, this kind of attack will not work from the internet. It requires access only within your home network. It can also be blocked by a firewall on the router if you're on a corporate network. But in any case, the fear of this feature is valid since this is a documented capability of the Intel management engine. By the way, for the last two to three years, most home laptops no longer come with IME enabled. It appears to be targeted only for corporate computers. Now let's transfer this idea to the mobile phone. You can see the idea that a phone could have a similar operation is not inconceivable. However, I did not think it was likely in the past. A mobile phone is not plugged in with unlimited AC power like an Intel computer, nor are they plugged into a wired network. Mobile phones use their battery life as a selling point. Maximizing the time a phone can be used is very important in phone marketing. So my guess is that the phone makers would have attempted to eliminate anything that could be draining power or running in the background that could affect the performance of the battery life of the phone. But there may be different technologies now where this may no longer be an issue, and I will explore that a little later. First, I'd like to talk about what Snowden really feared, and that was the idea that when your phone is hacked, you are not actually turning off the phone. It just looks like it's off. As you know, when you physically touch switches in a phone to do a full power down or even a restart, you actually have to interface with the OS. There's a prompt for you to confirm that you are really powering down. So the power down process is not even done by hardware, it's done by software. Let's suppose that someone fakes this, someone creates an app that simulates the power down screen, maybe even copies the designs so it matches what you see on your iPhone or Android. You tap on the screen and select the power off option. Then the screen blanks out and you think you've successfully turned off the phone. Now a rogue hacker could have just blanked the screen by programming it off. That hacker could then remove any output like sound or screen display and yet the phone microphone could still be on and listening. The GPS could still be tracking. Wi-Fi triangulation could still be occurring. The only difference is that you think it is off because the screen is dark. Is this a possible hack? Well, of course it is. Could you detect this? It may be difficult. I think one possible way to detect that a phone is still working even when the screen is dark is that the phone may still be warm to the touch. However, since the biggest consumer of power is actually the screen, the effect of this may only be discovered if it's slightly warm after hours of being turned off. It may not be apparent in a short period of time. Phones also get warm if they're plugged into their charger. So if a phone is usually charging when not in use, you may never know if the power is being used. So as you can see, Snowden's appreciation of this threat is valid. It could happen, especially for targeted individuals, like Snowden is. How do you defend against this kind of threat? The old solution was to take out the battery. Although a capacitor might still hold a power charge, usually you cannot get sustained activity when the battery is out. Of course, 99% of phones no longer have removable batteries, so this is no longer an option for most of us. The alternative is a Faraday bag or a Faraday case. I posted the link of a typical Faraday bag in the description. A Faraday bag is a container that is completely lined with an RF absorbing metal. It's not too different from wrapping your phone completely in aluminum foil. And this, of course, is where the tinfoil hat reference comes from. Metal foil can block RF signals. If you want to be absolutely sure a device isn't talking to anyone when you're not actively using it, that would be the only foolproof insurance. Something that has expanded this threat beyond the fake off that I described is the possibility of hardware still running in the background when the power is off. Now let me tell you a little known detail about phones. A typical phone comes with one main computer and many little computers. 
The two well-known components that are actually separate little computers are the Wi-Fi Bluetooth GPS module, which is one component, and then the cell baseband modem. A component that by itself is a full computer is called an SOC or system on a chip. And an SOC can also contain other SOCs. An instance of an SOC basically operates with its own operating system. It can also communicate independently of the main operating system, meaning iOS or Android. They also have their own software called device drivers, which are used to interface devices externally. And this is also typically provided by the component manufacturer. Normally the main operating system leaves the functionality to the manufacturer of these network components. So for a fact, the cell baseband modem, for example, can operate independently. How it interacts with the cell carriers is not completely apparent. In fact, this has been the source of many state level hacks since there are secret backdoors to it. And what's interesting is that it is not under the control of the phone OS, iOS or Android. And the programming code in it is proprietary and hidden and protected by many patents and controlled primarily by two companies, Qualcomm, a USA company, and MediaTek, a Taiwan company. Now, the only reason I do not suspect that the baseband modem is operating while the power is off is that the baseband modem consumes a lot of power. When on, it is basically a continuously operating radio. So this is not the best device, in my opinion, for communicating when the power is off. Aside from the SOC being an independent computer, the IME design also implies that even the power can be routed to individual components by software control and bypass the main switch. As you recall, the IME chip bypasses the computer switch and it always gets power as long as the computer is plugged in. Now, I can easily experiment with this myself. I have made projects on my Raspberry Pi little computer where I turn the power on and off to devices by directing power to the GPIO pins. You can use this to sound buzzers, trigger motion cameras, and so on. So again, software power switching is not a new concept and is common. What you can see here is that there is much we do not know about what can be done on a phone. A chip controller for power is likely and is also quite likely to be controlled by software. Let me now address a separate component which I now always give special attention to. This component is the Wi-Fi Bluetooth GPS module. Normally all these features are combined into one SOC nowadays. This component, which is a standard part of most mobile phones, did not in itself change much in the last few years. However, a new capability was added which utilized existing hardware, and that is the Bluetooth radio. The new capability, which is software driven only, is compatible with most newer Bluetooth radios and is called Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE. As the name Low Energy implies, it does not use a lot of power. Just to impress upon you how this works, BLE devices like Apple AirTags can communicate for an entire year using a small battery. The way BLE works is that short pulses of data are broadcast through the regular Bluetooth radio, the pulses only within milliseconds. Because of the shortness of the signal, the BLE device can transmit with a higher power, reaching up to 200 feet typically, and can still use extremely small amounts of battery power. The strength of the signal is controlled by software in Bluetooth and this allows your Bluetooth headphones to communicate continuously in low power while allowing BLE signals to shoot out at a higher power. So for a phone, the power needs of BLE are so minuscule as to not have any meaningful effect on a phone that's recharged daily. Now BLE is an interesting animal. You should watch my BLE related videos which I will add to the description so you can see why BLE is different. BLE is the supporting architecture for Apple AirTags, Tile Tags, Ring Cameras, Amazon Echoes, and Home IoT devices. BLE was also the capability likely used to enable contact tracing. It allows the creation of a mesh network, and that means devices can talk to each other peer-to-peer -peer without requiring an internet. The BLE standard also allows the forwarding of messages without an internet. In other words, BLE mesh network in itself is a communications network that operates separately from the internet. This is now the question we need to answer. If the power is off for the main phone, is it possible for the circuitry to still enable power to the Bluetooth module? 
Compared to all other components like even the Wi-Fi and GPS, this, as I said, is such a low energy draw device that no one would notice an extremely small drain. Could a phone manufacturer spec out a phone that would give power to the BLE module at all times? Technically speaking, if power can be directed by software to various components and even bypass a power switch, then clearly it is within the capability of current SOCs to allow this. Now you may ask, why would they want this? I'm not a tinfoil hat person by nature. When presented with a possibility like this, rather than randomly theorizing, I always look at a motive. So I always ask myself, what is there to be gained by adding this capability? A company like Apple could benefit from powering BLE on whether the phone is off or not. The reason is that the phone can participate in the mesh network by allowing forwarding of the messages from device to device. A device that is off may not have internet. Let's say an off phone detects an air tag. In theory, being off means it cannot use the internet. However, it is theoretically possible to forward the BLE message to another iPhone in the vicinity and that could repeat over and over until some iPhone is found with an internet connection. How likely is this scenario? At the moment, even with the lower power needs of BLE, I'm not sure a company like Apple needs to utilize BLE for this purpose since there are a sufficient number of phones that are powered on. It would seem like so much work for so little benefit but it is certainly possible. Well, that assumes that the reason for the technology is to power the mesh network, but what if the goal is to track phones even when the power is off? Now, this could be a valid objective, track locations when power is off. Why is this legitimately important? It could enable find my phone with the power off. That could have some impact with stolen phones. Of course, this technology would be deadly for surveillance. It would mean that you cannot escape location surveillance with the phone off unless you place the phone in a Faraday bag. Could this happen? Could an Apple or Google create this capability secretly? I think that this could only be done by the maker of the SOC. Apple in theory controls their own motherboard manufacturing processes so they can add things without anyone outside of the designers being aware of it. Google is not a hardware maker per se so this would be less likely for them. But the makers of the Android motherboards like Qualcomm and MediaTek could enable this capability quietly, just like they've enabled secret backdoors in the cell baseband modem. The makers of the Wi-Fi Bluetooth GPS component could build in an automatically running mesh network if they so desire. Remember, they're a separate SOC, so they could do things we do not know. I think most of these components are built by Qualcomm and Broadcom. It is not outside the realm of possibility. And the fact that Snowden raises this concern may be a hint that it is something that needs to be feared. All I'm adding today is that the BLE technology makes this even more likely and possible. However, I'm not telling you that this exists or not. I'm just saying it's within the realm of reasonable possibility. In other words, the current level of technology allows it. It is not science fiction. What I'm saying here is that to be completely safe means an awareness of possibilities. Do not assume that you can turn off any transmissions on your phone. If you have moments when you want to be particularly private and secure, such as journalists having a meeting with their sources, then do not trust that simply turning off a device will be safe. Other scenarios I would be concerned about are when you approach a location that could be geofence, for example, places where a protest is occurring or areas of riots, looting, vandalism, or crime areas. Always assume that a phone could be located even when the power is off, or if it's not really off, that it may have other features that can sense its environment like microphones and cameras. If you have a rare phone where you can remove the battery, then do so. Snowden asked that his visitors place their phones inside a microwave oven. For the rest of you, you may want to use a Faraday bag in these situations. Thanks for watching. See you next time.